Learn why some schools are doing away with the ACT. We'll learn about the hidden surprise in student government's budget. And we'll give you all you need to know about Colorado State's softball team. Good evening, Rams. I'm Edgar. And I'm Lauren. The yeah, Associated Students of CSU made a shocking discovery that has been overlooked by past council members. The current administration found more than $800,000 that has been untouched in the, over, in the rollover budget. The former AMPH ASCSU president, Josh Silva, along with other student body leaders, failed to use this fund. The current president, Tristan Siren, says after, ha, sa, says after saving a reasonable amount of the fund, ASCSU has about $500,000 dollars of spending money left. ASCSU hopes to use this newfound wealth to fund better student life and experiences on campus. Colorado State's latest big hire is breaking boundaries. The Board of Governors of CSU voted, voted unanimously last Friday to hire Joyce E. McConnell as the new university president. Reporter Janae Hancock brings us more. Uh, we're here on a very uh, exciting day. Uh, two weeks ago, the Board of Governors uh, culminated the uh, first part of that search process by naming as a sole finalist uh, for the position of President of CSU, Joyce McConnell. Uh, we are required by statute to then go through a 14-day or two-week period before uh, reconvening to consider the final question, and so here we are 14 days later. I commend Joyce McConnell highly and without reservation to be um, appointed as the 15th president of Colorado State University. I think it's not um, perhaps CSU's finest uh, moment that we haven't had a female president yet, and I'm very excited about it. And, and beyond those aspects, she's just amazingly qualified. I think she'll bring a great deal to the, to the table for the university, and she'll take it to its next level. <laughs> Any opposition to the motion? Hearing none, the motion is unanimously approved, and we welcome the 15th president of Colorado State University, Joyce McConnell. It's such an emotional time. I'm so incredibly excited and honored. Um, this is an extraordinary university. So to have the opportunity to come here and to lead this university um, after you've had such an amazing president in Tony Frank. So to be able to move this place from where he's brought it in his time here, I'm just thrilled. Her campus, um, in fact, seems sad to see her depart, which I am unfamiliar with. Um, <laughs> with a sense of humor, genuine personality, and passion for success, McConnell believes she's ready to take on CSU. He, someone said I was going to have big shoes to fill at last night's meeting with students. I said my shoes are prettier. <laughs> <laughs> Being the first female president, McConnell is excited for what's to come. And the fact that I'm coming in as the 15th president, the first female in the 150th year, I think is somewhat extraordinary and something that we really need to embrace and celebrate. I think that it is a real testament to the fact that women can succeed um, and that they can see, succeed particularly to lead a land-grant institution in the United States. This is Janae Hancock reporting with CTV. Tristan Siren, president of the Associated Students of CSU, told Source he is confident Joyce McConnell will always have the students' best interests at heart. The body found at the base of Horsetooth Reservoir on Thursday has been identified as 65-year-old physician Daniel Hennich. The Lamar County Coroner's Office ruled his death as accidental from blunt force trauma caused by the falling. Though Hennich struggled with his, with his own daughter's murder 10 years ago, his family came forward saying due to his beliefs, he would not have ended his own life. According to his brother Sam Hennich, in the Colorado and the preliminary coroner's report indicated his death was likely immediate. 47-year-old disability advocate Vivian Armendariez, born and raised in Loveland, Colorado, died of renal failure at the Poudre Valley Hospital on Saturday. Armendariez, advocated for both the disabled and the poor in Fort Collins and often attended city council meetings in order to do so. Her sister, Anna Walisa, excuse me, Armin Desaria, said to the Coloradoan, she called the shots in life. I don't know anybody who has overcome more barriers on their own terms. 
Born with spina bifida, Vivian was confined to a wheelchair. During her life, she developed a close friendship with law enforcement. Her memorial service will be held at the Poudre Valley Fire Authority Station, number six, this Saturday at one in the afternoon. The controversial red flag bill is making its way through the Capitol and has counties and sheriffs in Colorado turning against each other. The red flag bill, which would allow law enforcement and families to obtain a court order to take away the guns of those that they believe pose a threat. The bill, which passed along party lines in both the House and the Senate, is expected to make its way to Governor Jared Polis for approval. Several law enforcement agencies have come out against the bill, including Larimer County Sheriff Steve Reams, who told CNN he's willing to go to jail for not enforcing the law. On the other hand, Douglas County Sheriff Tony Spurlock is in favor of this bill after, after Douglas County Deputy Zach Parrish was killed in the line of duty in 2017 for whom the bill is named after. But Douglas County officials don't support the bill. The county commissioners passed a resolution in opposition to the red flag bill. Douglas County joins 31 other counties in the state that have formally, uh, that have formally opposed the red flag bill. Here in Lambert County, while no official resolution has come out against the bill, the county commissioners and Sheriff Justin Smith have raised their concerns with the bill, citing Fourth Amendment rights and concern with law enforcement safety. The bill is expected to be signed by Governor Jared Polis within the next 30 days and won't become law until 2020. Have you ever been so stressed out that you just want to crawl into a bubble? Well, Fort Collins might just have the newest place for you. Reporter Isabella Roberts has more on the technology that's made its way to the front range. Addiction, PTSD, anxiety, insomnia, and more disorders are all areas that the ThetaPod treats. Fort Collins has a ton of super health-minded, holistic people, and I knew that Fort Collins would be a great place for something like this. We have super high-tech wellness stuff, but um, it's really different than what we have so far here in Fort Collins, and I thought that this would be a great community that would be open to it. Kathleen emphasized that clients set the Theta Chamber settings themselves to directly so the cater to their needs. Binaural beats are put on to help the cerebral hemispheres synchronize. Visual light pattern stimulation is used to help induce a state of deactivation. Microcurrent signaling is administered through clips on your ears. I definitely felt um, different right away um, but it wasn't until I think until for me you know I think everyone's going to be different but um, for me it was definitely about ha halfway I really felt a lot of the a lot of the things really start to stick and um, um, be a little more concrete. Ryan used the Theta Pod for 28 days to help treat his area of needs. But it also can help with a lot of cool things like mental clarity and focus and it can even provide um, something of a spiritual connection or experience in there. It kind of depends on what your intention is and what you're here for, what you're working on. This is Isabella Roberts reporting with CTV. For more information on ThetaPods and Fort Collins' newest wellness center, you can visit happywholeu.com. The college admissions, admissions process was never an easy one, but, so, but for some that process could become easier. The University of Denver announced last month that it won't require prospective students to submit ACT or SAT scores. The move by DU hopes to attract a more diverse group of students following the, including those from a low income or first generation background. DU is not the first school to do so. More than a thousand, more than a thousand schools across the country already don't require SAT or ACT scores. Schools like ASU, New York University, and the University of Texas at Austin here at CSU, SAT or ACT scores are still required for admissions. In a statement, Leslie Taylor, Vice President for Enrollment and Access says, in terms of making these test scores optional, we've been keeping an eye on the emerging national trend. We're always considering, we're, we're always considering our admissions requirements in the direction of increasing fairness to student applicants and ensuring that we are admitting students with the best chance of success. Today, I hit the plaza to see what students had to say. students who don't have the resources to get tutoring or go through like the study classes that are offered 
because I feel like the SAT and ACT is really about those classes and not really about what you actually learn in high school. Um, and that kind of divides people who have the means to do so and those who don't. When you look at the history of ACT and SATs and how they've been written, there are studies that show that um, they're written for white people and for white people to get good scores on them. And when you look at like the recent scandal with people paying to have SAT scores changed, the systems that are holding different identities back I think is something that I support. I think there's a lot of ways to, to determine if a student is qualified to succeed at a university um, past their SAT or ACT scores. These kinds of tests don't really account for, you know, different disabilities, um, especially like people who just know the material but need more time, like there's no real way to adjust for that and they don't adjust for it and I just feel like that's unfair to those students and so. So Lauren, I have to see what your take is on SAT or ACT scores, what do you think? So I see both sides of it. I I think that standardized testing is definitely hard and it's, um, I know not a lot of students are good at just taking tests, I know I'm one of those people, but I did take the test twice, the ACT twice, and I did improve. So I see both sides of it. For sure. I, I'm the same way. I'm definitely not a test taker, but I also did take the test three times just to see if I could keep getting higher scores, and it did, but I feel like being in college now, I feel like I really didn't really need the test. So Right, yeah. It is kind of interesting to see um, how this will be changing throughout colleges across the country, so we'll see how it keeps changing. So. Yeah, definitely. Good point. So today is also a national holiday that we have to talk about. Yes. Um, the, it's Today is uh, the Polliner Institute's uh, nonprofit that owns Political Facts celebrates in equipping citizens, journalists, and professional fact checkers and educators with resources to help separate fact from fiction. So do you know how to separate fact from fiction, Lauren? Yes, well I know a few good tips. I definitely think that it's important to read the entire article before you get your entire opinion on it. Um, I think that it's also important to, to check the URL and the author of the source, check their credibility, see if that, you know, what they're writing makes sense. And then also cross-check, so try to find other articles that are talking about the same subject to make sure it's correct. For sure, and something that, um, was all, that also came up with this was Twitter bots. We've all been a victim or have seen Twitter bots in some shape or form. And I th they released some s ways to spot them, so I think the three big ones were check their followers and see who they're following and all that kind of stuff. Also check, one that surprised me the most was check to see when that profile was created. So the more recent it is, the probably the more sketchy it is. And the other thing was find them on other social media platforms. So check Instagram, Facebook, and all those just to see if they are a valid account too. Yeah, absolutely. I think those are great tips. Awesome. And then before we go tonight, we wanted to update you on the election. Results haven't come in yet as polls just closed, but we will be bringing you updates on CTV's Twitter account and on Thursday night's news show. And don't go anywhere, Rams. Up next, we have Hannah Willis with weather. Listen, I realize that I'm not perfect, but it all really started to change because you judge me for having a problem. No one is going to know that I need help. I need help. I know that no one is going to judge me for having a problem. I realize that I'm not perfect, but it all really started to change because you listen. Okay, so we drowned the fire. Yep.